Um, okay, now I'm going to introduce Sam with great delight. Um, thank you so much, Sam, for being here and being our first guest of the whole series. Um, yeah, I'm just going to read out your um, bio to introduce you to our audience. Sam Awinger is a sonic thinker, composer and sound artist. He lives and works in Berlin since receiving an invitation to the Berliner Künstler Program of the DRRD in 1997. His interest is, is the sonic and auditory as material phenomena that embed information about our shared global interdependence and emotional triggers. Central to his artistic research aims to deepen understanding of acoustic or aural qualities in our urban living environments, precisely public spaces. Sam propagates thinking with the ears. For him, it is a critical daily praxis towards understanding our role in an endangered planetary environment at all levels from social to environmental. Together with Bruce Odland, he founded ONA um, in 1989. Their central theme is hearing perspective and known for large scale public space sound installations that transform city noise in real time such as Blue Moon 2004, New York, Sonic Vista, Frankfurt, Germany since 2011, um, Symphony of Resonances, Documenta 14, Thessaloniki, um, Greece, um, 2017. Um, so I'm really excited to have Sam here. Um, I studied with Sam um, 2008 to 2010, a long time ago in Berlin in my master's at the University of Arts and I really learned so so much about listening and sound and more than I can probably really fathom through Sam so I'm so delighted and happy to have you here Sam. Yeah thank you very very much Annie and um, hello to everybody. So I just would like to give you at first a little bit of an overview of how I would like that we do this. Um, I think it's at first, I would like to talk a little bit about my past from where I'm coming. Then I would just like to that we deep maybe a little bit the, the, the concept or the idea of hearing perspective and thinking with your ears. Then we go through a couple of pieces and we can talk in more detail about certain type of things. Then I know Annie was asking you, or I was asking Annie, to, that she asked you, the guys, that you bring a kind of a little bevel or something with you. Uh, I would like that we do a, just a simple experiment, which is not so much about the um, uh, direct outcome, but it's more about how we can, how we tune in together, that we tune into the spaces where everybody's sitting in. But when I look at the at different pictures, I yeah, everybody has its own different type of space and also its different type of acoustics. And the other thing is I would absolutely ask you, uh, please, whenever comes up a question, uh, if something, I'm too fast, whatever, uh, please use the, the chat window, uh, write something in, Annie will help me uh, and Michael uh, to keep track of these things and or make yourself uh, um, you're seen, heard, uh, and, and interrupt and ask. Because I think it's really important uh, that whatever comes up that we, that we do this. So let me let me just start. Um, at least the way I, I am socialized as an artist, and uh, I am working. I think childhood and from where I'm coming is how old I get, how more it reads out as something important in my work. So for you maybe to know, it's really interesting at first. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm really quite old comparing to you, you know, so I'm, I'd be born 1956 in Upper Austria and I grew up on the edge between a kind of industrial city Linz on the banks of, along the Danube and, and the huge um, Augustina Chorier Cloister, St. Florian, whoever is into music from you uh, knows maybe St. Florian because this is the place where Anton Bruckner comes from. So I actually grew up in this kind of, of rural um, agriculture environment where the city was 15 kilometers away, but still it was like very, very far away. And when I think back on this time, then I really realized that when I was a child, sound was basically information and music was social. 
This means that people could run a farmhouse, that people could, could organize their daily lives. They needed the input of the auditory. They needed the information, all, all things what the auditory could tell. So just, just one, one funny, not funny, but a, a special story in a way. Uh, my grandpa, for example, when I was a little kid, he was famous for that he was taking in the summer hay and he was putting it to his ear. He was making some noise, listen to it and say, and saying, uh, and forecasting the weather. For example, saying, okay, this afternoon we will have a storm. So let's, let's speed up, let's get in whatever we have to get in. When I was a kid, this was like a huge miracle. How could he hear in hay what's going on with the weather. But when you think about hay is a material which is really taking on the pressure changes in air in kind of how the moisture level changes very, very fast. So actually, if you know the interdependencies between air pressure, materiality, weather, you for sure, you can listen to hay and you can say uh, how the weather will change. The other thing that was really uh, remarkable for me as a kid, you know, there was for sure no surveillance cameras, but we knew exactly if somebody foreign approached the farmhouse, because the goose were immediately telling you <laughs> whoever came. So um, I was reading as a kid, maybe, um, you know, doing little forbidden things, you know, sitting in the kitchen and reading a, 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 a comics, which was not appropriate at that time. So I could hear by the steps if somebody is approaching me where I have to put it away. So what I just want to say is that listening to the environment in any kind of field was an absolutely daily praxis. But one reason why people did it in that way was also because all the sounds were somehow talking to them. The same thing still happens when you walk through the city of London, but the big difference is that 99% of all the sounds you're hearing don't, you, to, you hear them, they talk somehow to you, but without really a kind of meaning, because uh, uh, what is the truck or, or the car, whatever is passing by, what does it tell you besides that there's traffic going on? So in, and the other thing what was really interesting is that um, you, you also have to imagine when I was a kid, for example, one of the most famous or, or, or games what we like to play in the outside was that we had a kind of, um, of, a, of a wooden hut standing next to the road and somebody had to go behind it, couldn't see what type of car or machine is approaching the house. And we had to tell what kind of car is approaching. And what's really, it's almost impossible to, to imagine this nowadays, but really each type of car or machine had a very, very distinct different type of sound. So for example, a, a VW Beetle was a super, super easy, easy example uh, comparing to a Mercedes 190 diesel or whatever. So each type of car machine, you could definitely read by the sound. Um, this is in that type of way uh, 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 important for what we are talking today is because I think it's getting harder and harder for us uh, to really acknowledge that whatever kind of sound we hear, that sound all times carries two types of qualities. It carries the quality of information and it, and it carries the quality of aesthetic, of a kind of an emotional contour. And when we then start to perceive or observe in a way the environment also from the auditory sense, then we also start to realize very, very fast that actually what we can hear tells most of the time a very different story as what we can see. And so um, just to lay out a little bit from, from where, I'm, where I'm coming in, and I realized that how old I'm getting, how more I'm still relating also to this, to this child's uh, um, your experiences. The other thing that was very interesting for me is that Growing up in St. Florian and growing up next to this unbelievable monstrous instrument of the Bruckner organ, which has something like 8,700 um, tubes, um, I didn't have to wait for techno um, or modern 
electronic music to get an idea what bass is doing. This monstrous instrument goes down to 20 hertz. So, um, and so if, if you experience one, a kind of an organ concert in a, in a, in a cathedral uh, with one of these monstrous instruments, you really, you really realize that this type of instrument is really keeping the whole spectrum of, of musical textures we are actually be able to perceive. And this is in that type of way really important because I don't know how much you guys be also in the way, um, you know, the different type of, of customs and procedures of different type of religions. So for example, Upper Austria, where I was growing up is heavy Catholic, is a very he heavy Roman Catholic area. And um, many people uh, in Germany, for example, where I'm living saying, um, you know, that the Catholic Olems had the best show. So a mess of the Catholic was Olems a kind of a very uh, a big scenario, you know, where, where actually the way how the churches have been built, the Baroque churches, for example, you know, they, they'd be really like psychotropic machines. They really try to enhance with architecture, the way how the space sounds and all this type of things. It really tries to lift you or to suppress you. You know, it's, 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 it's really something where the materiality of the world and design of the world is really also taking as something which can, um, yeah, which is somehow also in a, in a positive or negative, I don't know, how, but still it tries to manipulate your senses. It tries to manipulate uh, the way how you perceive certain things. For example, when you when you watch out uh, certain type of cathedrals or, or, or special uh, big um, Baroque churches, then you will see that normally on a Sunday between 10 and 11, there is the big mess, you know, where, where everybody comes together. So this kind of tainted windows are really, and the churches are built and laid out in, uh, in a geographical structure that for sure around this time, the sun is hitting this type of, of colored windows. So you really get this kind of, of huge sky in the church. So this church have been, and the Catholic procedure is definitely one which is very, very much using the ability of design of how you treat spaces, how you act in spaces also to, uh, to underline their message, their task, however you want to call it. But what you then learn from this is that actually any kind of architecture has a kind of a psychotrop quality. It, and, and, and what, what does a psychotropic quality mean? It, it, it means that whatever happens and you experience in it, it just pushes or enhances one emotional direction for you, uh, which is definitely not the same for everybody, but it has, it has this type of thing like, you know, like coffee is not acting for everybody the same, but overall it's just, I don't know, uh, a lifting energy or whatever. And that think also different type of architectures are definitely in the way how they reflect sound, how they resonate sound, how, they, how the light game uh, works in it, does definitely something to our upside chick. And we can, we can observe this consciously, can get the kind of a feeling for it, um, you know, or we just think it's what it is. But there's quite a lot of, 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 of thinking and, and uh, creativity put into the last thousands of years. And, and somehow maybe we'd be just at the moment that the, at the period in, for example, in architecture where the monetary system, let's say the efficiency of how money is used in, in, in building things and how space is used from their function um, uh, giving them a completely different type of touch. Because just imagine uh, you, have to, you have to make a building or you, you, you have to build something um, where people have to be able to observe somebody and really have the audibility that they can listen to a talk to, of somebody uh, for 200 people without the speaker system. 
So uh, you really have to think about how actually you organize architecture and how you do certain type of things that it fits your, your needs, you know. And this you can um, uh, see throughout the centuries in architecture that this was definitely, there was a kind of a knowledge about it. And I'm sure you also, I don't know how, how it's for you. Is everybody of you pretty sure how actually the basic acoustics are working? What's the speed of sound? How sound waves propagate? Is this something what you'd be interested in and, and, and what you actually also take in account when you, when you uh, do any kind of sound work? I know you just can't answer at the moment like this, but, but, but just, just take it as a question, you know? So, um, I started. I started to study in um, after beginning at the university to 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 studying economics and mathematics. I was going. I stopped this, and I was going to the Mozarteum in Salzburg, studying composition and computer music. And you just have to imagine you do this in the early eighties. So uh, going in the early eighties to. Uh, the music university in, in, in Salzburg was at that time the first one in the German speaking domain doing a kind of a collaboration with Stanford, uh, where you actually could study computer music. Uh, just doing this at that time, you really have to imagine I had to learn Fortran. Um, we had to, we had really to think about almost any aspect of sound and you had to find a way how to describe it. So by doing this, you also start to realize very, very much and very, very fast how, how many things and properties of sound you are taking as given. For example, I had no idea at that time um, about the work from, from, from Pierre Schaeffer, uh, Radio France, you know, uh, the music concrete, I did not know about at that time, I learned I learned at that time also that this existed and I learned about the experiments. And for example, one of the most interesting experiments for me at the time was that when they started to cut off from different type of, you know, they recorded uh, an A ah from a voice, from a violin, from a flute. And then they took away the attack of the envelope. And then they realized that it was not really, that the human, the human here was not really able anymore to, identify what type of instrument this was. So it actually took quite long to understand in sound and in acoustics, how, what kind of important role the envelope of a sound plays, you know, the attack, the sustain, the release, and how much you actually need all this type of thing. So for example, when you then think that you want to go uh, with a computer and you want to describe uh, a kind of an imaginary sound, uh, you also realize that actually uh, you get stuck very, very fast with all the sounds you know from the traditional instruments. And actually it happens pretty much the same. I don't know if you ever were running into a book with these deep sea creatures. And I'm sure as a little kid, you tried once to invent strange creatures and whatever you invented looked very, very thin compared what's actually living in this deep sea, you know, uh, you, it, it's, it's almost impossible to imagine this type of creatures. Um, and, and something similar happens with sound, you know, with sound, you really realize that certain principles of sound, when you start to think about how to describe it and to make it on a machine, um, that, the, that they appear over and over and that there are certain type of systems built into the way how we perceive sound, why we can actually act with certain type of sounds or what actually then comes up is that you get an introduction <laughs> through your own research to something what's called psychoacoustic. You realize by doing this, by describing sounds, you realize that your, your body, your ear, your, your, your listening apparatus acts very, very different than a microphone. And this actually, and I wanna make here a faster turn uh, this actually was bringing me to the situation that I became more and more interested in public space through this type of work, through, through, through learning to, to program sounds, because I realized how much daily life are really also conducting the way I'm perceiving music. 
And I want to give you a very, very funny example on this. When I was, um, when I was a little kid, uh, for the, let's say, becoming 12, 13, 14, all the, all the elder kids around were into the early beat and uh, uh, rock and roll music. So, for example, for my parents, uh, it was impossible to listen to Rolling Stones or to the Move or to Led Zeppelin or whatever. This was just poor noise for them. When 2000, my father died, and I experienced a quite intensive time with my mother. We were driving once in the car, and in the radio was running from the Rolling Stones, I'm walking the dog. And my mother just said, actually, a nice song. And I was really jumping on the brake because I could not understand that she, who hated one so much, this type of music calls it now actually a nice song. So, but what really happened is that her listening, her hearing got so much transformed in the last 30, 40 years that now she could actually decode the song structure. And in the 60s, when these songs appeared, where she was coming from this kind of upper Austrian folk music, it was completely impossible for her just to hear this music. What this tells us is how much all these types are being in flux. And when we then think about together, when we hear a sound event, how many systems are really, really coming into the play? You know, and I just see here uh, that somebody says here that the speed of sound is 300 meters per second. Just want to make a little uh, quote to this. The really interesting thing with sound is that this is approximately right, but I would say by a temperature of 60 to 70 degrees. Because sound has, the speed of sound is 343 meters per second at the temperature of 20 degrees Celsius, which means actually that you can hear temperature. Because temperature is the, is the only thing that really affects sound extremely. So if, because when you think about how sound waves are propagating, this is like molecules pushing one molecule, one air molecule to the next in kind of, in this type of wave type. So how hotter it is, how more energy is in it, and how faster this happens. This means, how, how hot the air, how higher is the pitch, how, how lower, uh, how colder, how lower is the pitch. And, and if somebody of you is an instrument player, for example, a flute or a, or a fagot or whatever, and he tries to play in a, in a cold area like in Austria in winter uh, together with the church organ or whatever, then he really gets troubles to tune his instrument because everything gets so low. But what I, sorry, um, sorry, I'm just making sure check if I'm if I'm not missing too much out here. Anyway, uh, but what I wanted I wanted to 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 go back to this that that uh, it becomes it became very very clear by 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 starting at this early time about computer music how much actually the brain the body and the way how as humans, how we be constructed is involved, how we perceive sound and actually also how much our habits are being part of it. And, and I was putting out first the question saying how many systems are coming into play when we hear a sound. And just, just really think about when there's any kind of sound event, if I just do this, you know, very simple, stupid little short, short impulse. Um, then what really happens is at first there's a kind of a acoustic, a physics phenomena, which means there is some material hits another material and sound propagates in, in glass different as it propagates in air. So all of this together produces this type of sound. The way I'm hearing it has a lot to do with my physiological disposition and the way how my hearing apparatus works. 
For example, I'm sure uh, you guys all know this type of, of, of in-ear headphones, like from Apple or whatever, no? So this, our ear canal, the way our, how our ear canal and, and, and our ears are shaped, they are actually enhancing a certain type of frequency spectrum. And when you look and think about that a human is able, let's say a young healthy human, let's say four or five years old has a kind of a listening range from 20 Hertz to 20 kilohertz. So when I do this, more or less everybody can hear it, but the big difference is between me and my little grandson is that he hears much more overtones than I hear. Because one, one thing what we realize when we investigate what's going on, the way how we perceive the world with our ears and with our hearing apparatus in our body is that actually over time, the ability to hear high frequencies is degrading. This actually produces in a kind of a society which is so much based on language and on communication through language, uh, quite an interesting problem. Because when you think about that our language, the way how we talk, that this is composed out of vowels and consonants. And when you then maybe do yourself the favor once with a spectrogram and you're saying so, ah, a, e, o, u, you know, and you realize how your vowels are working, then you see that your vowels are having a very slow and strong fundamental. And this all happens depending on your voice between let's say 100 and 250 Hertz. But all the consonants, the st, st, all these type of things, all this which actually makes our language to a language is very, very high up in the spectrum. Most of it, it's above uh, eight, nine, 10 kilohertz. So I'm doing, I'm being now 65 and I do a yearly listening check. I do a check how my hearing works. And I'm now in the range of 11 kilohertz. So 11 kilohertz is my highest frequency I can hear, which is quite good for my age, but it's, I'm still comparing to my grandson, I'm missing out quite a lot of information. And this has other type of consequences. This is the consequences, for example, when I watch in Berlin on a Friday night and and um, Annie knows exactly what I'm talking about in Friedrichshain or wherever, where lots of young people be out and it's, it's noisy, it's chaotic, it's, it's hopping, you know? Then you guys mostly can take this in as an energy. You read it as something going on, as something which actually enhances you. But if elder people walk through the same scene, maybe in the age of 70 or above or whatever, with much more or less frequency response in their, in their hearing. For them, this is stress. The same situation, but for one of us is something like which lifts him, which gives him energy, is for somebody else stress. So now we have acoustics and we have psychoacoustics. The third thing, whenever I, whatever kind of sound I hear, what comes into play is actually the culture I'm coming from. Because just imagine, I mean, I'm coming from this Catholic culture, wherever I go and if I hear a bell sound, it will have a completely different meaning to me as to somebody who grew up in a completely non-religious environment where bells had no meaning, was, did not structure time, etc. Or, you know, What's also super interesting is what I, what I really had to learn coming to Berlin. I mean, in Berlin lives a huge Turkish community. The Turkish community comparing to an Austrian community is a much more an outdoor community. So they like to be in the park, they like to grill, they like to be big families together. They also have a completely different understanding in such open areas, environments of towards noise, you know, something what's, what's for, maybe um, an Austrian um, pass by a, something like as a noisy environment is for them just the kind of a beautiful uh, family scene, you know? So the next thing what we have, the third thing is culture. And then comes maybe the most underestimated part which plays a role when we perceive a sound, which is 
the personal history, the personal context. Just imagine you are having somewhere a kind of, a, of, a, of an atelier, a working space, an office, and in front of you, there's a parking lot and two people are rehearsing skateboarding. If you be a skateboarder and if you hear a special sound, you think maybe, oh, he managed this with 60. But if you don't like skateboarding and have nothing to do with skateboarding, it's just only annoying. So when you then think about that, when we all be together in a room and we hear a sound, how just the different cultures, the different uh, um, your ages, whatever, that actually it's almost completely impossible to really read a sound the same way like people next to you. So, so we have some certain type of agreements and we can make some kind of understandings. And the other thing what's really interesting is, is that you realize then when you go into this more or deeper, then you also start to realize what really noise and loudness does. You realize that loudness actually steals space. So for example, when you walk in London on a really heavy, busy road, then everything what happens on the other side of the road is a kind of a silent movie for you. You have, so, so the road actually acts as a border in space. So, and, and the other thing what's really interesting is, is that when you do this and when you be next to this heavy road, then also the road makes, you know, maybe you see very far, but you can't listen far. So you have this kind of funny, strange situation. And what we know now from psychology and, 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 and other kinds of combinations of psychic and, 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 and neurosciences is that actually the human is built in a way that we constantly watch out for self-referential things. So when you walk somewhere and there's, and it's impossible for you, also for your unconscious part, that you can hear yourself, your steps, the, the, the closing or whatever, then, then you have been in a pretty healthy situation that this is not taking from you. So what I just want to say is what all came out of this is a kind of a studying how we actually listen, how we hear, and you will find millions of things in this direction which are feeding into this. So I, I can also give afterwards, uh, afterwards uh, uh, any I'm sure at Greece up you find everything uh, uh, what's out on this, but but to just just want to, to make you really aware of that you think about this type of things in multi-dimensional things. And the other thing is why um, um, after studying at the Mozarteum, uh, I was in the funny situation that, I, that in my hometown actually the Ars Electronica was founded. So from 1987 on, I could experience the Ars Electronic and I was actually uh, from the very, very beginning somehow involved in it. And I could also see in a way how much, let's say, media, technology, and all these kind of things, how much they, they be part actually the way how we understand social life and how we interact. And in 1989, actually, I was, I was uh, sorry, as electronics started uh, 1979. Uh, and 10 years later, I was, I was uh, nine years later, uh, 87, I was meeting Bruce Odland there. And when I met Bruce Odland, uh, he was an American composer. Uh, we both realized by talking that we both tried to find an understanding towards the world from us, what we call the hearing perspective. We really just wanted to, we wanted to challenge the so-called visual perspective with an equivalent. But you, then you realize very, very fast that actually there is not half as much of a appropriate language how to describe sonic and auditory phenomena. And one thing we also agreed about very, very much was that we actually want to bring people into experiential situations through installations in public space where you address certain type of situations and hope or, or actually count on that they will bring some kind of narrations in play. And 
I think since I'm now talking for quite a while, um, maybe it would also make a little break if we would just uh, watch one of the works, which then also makes sense more to, to, to talk in more detail. Uh, Michael, would it be possible that we watch the, the, the short movie from Blue Moon? Because then also our audience can also hear Bruce's voice because a lot of what I'm talking about has also to do with him and, and, and his type of work. Yeah, I'll share that now. Blue Moon was installed in 2004 on the World Financial Center Plaza overlooking the New York City Harbor. The idea was to retune the environment to make it more musical so that people could connect to the world around them. Three tuning tubes of different lengths were attached to the seawall generate harmony in response to the noise. The lowest one sounded like this. Here's the sound of the middle tide. As the waters rise, it changes the acoustics of the harbor and the tuning. Of course, these tides are generated by the phases created special loudspeakers to create a soft dome of sound. And they functioned as street furniture. For four months, we altered the sonic identity of the plaza. People thanked us or reminding them that there were tides. Blue Moon was sponsored by Creative Time, the World Financial Center Arts and Events, and Battery Park City Authority. Okay. Uh, Michael, could you do me also the favor and to put up this one uh, sketch from, from Blue Moon? Look, guys, my, my problem really a little bit is that I'm, um, Annie maybe can tell you from her own experiences, me, I'm, I'm normally very reactive to what I feel from the audience. And, and so, so I, I don't know really if I lost you before, uh, but what I will try now is to, to show you a little bit the interest we, we had and why we were going into, into public space. So what you saw before is, um, um, so you also have to imagine that this maybe is also very, very important. When I started out to do installations and this type of thing, there was no sound art. It, nobody was talking about sound art. This was completely, there was some visual artists like Bruce Nauman or whatever, they really worked with sound as material. And then there were composers and, and so-called new music thinkers, whatever, like John Cage, whatever they really did with installation environments, they worked with sound. But there was no something like sound art. And wherever we could go and to do this type of pieces and things, we had to go to so-called media festivals. Because media festivals, 
were the only festivals at that time, like the Waitway in Rotterdam, the Ars Electronica, uh, uh, the Syrian one in, in, in Silicon Valley. So, so there were a couple in Japan, there were a couple of festivals and stuff where people were interested in these kind of questions, but it was really about media. It was like about how, how so for example, there is really famous, famous uh, uh, discussions and symposiums of the Ars Electronica uh, where Annie knows a lot about this, where William Fluss and all these all these philosophers, they have been Virilio, uh, uh, all these kind of guys, they were thinking about what actually this means to us when when we when we be able to, um, for example, it, it's maybe impossible for you guys even to imagine what kind of stress it was for somebody like me in the age of 12 or 15 to getting for a holiday in Vienna a little camera from my mother, which had the ability for 12 photographs. So when you have something where you just can make 12 photographs, you know, the medium to, for, for, for doing a photo is something completely different as you would make nowadays photos on Hindi. So the thing for us was, for Bruce and me when we met was, how can we actually, we were composers, we understood ourselves as composers, and we also understood all the times our installations as, as, as compositions. And our big wish was somehow to find real-time material, to, to, to find settings where we can actually turn an environment, to transform an environment into to we sound into something different and make things perceivable they've been not obvious before so when we for example walking around bruce lives in new york and we have been so many times to get in new york when we were going to the world financial center for many many times and you can imagine after especially after 9 11 where uh, uh the world financial center which is next to it um was next to it was breaking down it was a very prominent uh, a spot and so we realized that this is one of the most beautiful spots of Manhattan, but it's completely polluted and overtaken by helicopters in the air and by this kind of ferry boats between New Jersey and, and um, New York, which have the tendency out of speeding up the economy that when this ferry boat lands, it doesn't do a normal landing. It just pushes by running the motor against the wall. The people jump off the boat, the next people jump on. So everything is done with, with the support of huge machines to speed up the process. The other thing that was so interesting on this area of the, of the World Financial Center uh, was that how does the remaining skyscrapers have been built and stand to each other, uh, they produced unbelievable strange, and they still do, uh, uh, acoustic phenomena. For example, we learned by investigating there that when, you know, like New York is a place like maybe London is in England and Berlin is in Germany, whereas a school class, when you be from another little city, you do once in your school time a trip together to the city. So also in US, lots of school class all over US go to New York once for a week. And they, they had a rule that in this harbor uh, next to the World Financial Center, if there are school classes with, with blind kids, handicapped blind kids, they had have to be carried on their hand because they would fall otherwise into the water. They, they be so, the space is so confusing with these reflections that uh, uh, the normal, the auditory sense didn't work properly anymore. For example, you really could hear a helicopter four times and you could not say where it really is, even not if, you, if you didn't have the chance to look at it. So, so we found this on one hand, very, very beautiful spot. And on the other hand, very, very conflicting spot. At the same time, this kind of, of, of basin where the boats, are, uh, the yachts, etc., cetera, and, uh, uh, are being there, combined with the tides of the Hudson and the Atlantic, are uh, being a kind of a very, very huge sounding box. Just imagine you have something which, is, which lowers each day two meters and then becomes higher. So whatever happens outside on machines, it resonates different. But whenever we showed this to somebody, nobody understood what we are talking about. So then we realized actually we, we have somehow to make clear how much the nature cycle, the cosmic cycle, um, allow me a sidestep. 
The interesting thing is between a city and the rural landscape where I was growing up. In the rural landscape where I was growing up as a kid, it was completely clear that you are living in a, in a world, or I was growing up in a world which was connected to the planetary and to the cosmic cycle and kind of the seasons. Uh, uh, you know, I, a time like this, uh, uh, brought certain type of fruits on the table, put different type of colors on my on my daily school way. So so it was very easy to perceive that everything is somehow planetary wise connected. You know that that uh, it, but this is much much harder in the middle of of London or in the middle of New York. You know for sure you know that there are seasons, but actually modernity and all our technology is doing more or less to try to keep a kind of standard we like to keep the same temperature the whole uh, during the whole year to keep the same light level. And, and, and so people lose actually the ability to read these interdependencies between nature and built environment. And this was the reason why we actually came up with this piece because the idea was there's in US also a saying, I don't know if this is also in English, uh, in, in England, that when in the calendar months, there are two full moons this month is called a blue moon. And since we knew that in our installation, we will have two times, uh, uh, we will have this happen. This was the reason why we called the installation blue moon. And what we really try to do is to make perceivable that actually besides our business and linear time from the city, there is a second time running constantly around us. And this is why when you look now at this kind of sketch, what you see this kind of sine wave curve is nothing else as the changing low and high tides. So by putting actually and combining the high, the middle and the low tides to a different type of resonance and making it through the speakers perceivable, gave people the chance to read the tides and to read this connection. And when you look at the guest book from this, from this installation, you really see that many, many people thanked us to make them aware that there are tides. Because in New York, you'd be so pushed basically to this kind of picture view perception of sight that to look at something and it looks nice or it looks awful, whatever, but you're not, you've been not used to really perceive over time. And this was the reason why we actually wanted to do this piece. And, 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 and this brings me also to another question to you. What I learned over time is that when I want to do pieces in public space, it's super, super important that, that I get the scale right for what I'm doing and, 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 and that I find the right tools. For example, you saw in the in the little movie this type of blue speakers so it was very very important for us when you project in a, on a plaza a type of a sound and people can approach the plaza naturally from different type of directions it would be really a disaster if you would have a speaker which has a direction how it propagates so since there was no speakers to be able to buy they were omnidirectional so we started to build them and this is what happened many, many times for these works. And this is also part of the composition to really define very, very clear how you propagate this transformed sound and how you actually do this. The other thing is when you look and who, who, if you be uh, musically familiar on the chart, then you see for sure that the three tubes are running on a kind of what's called a music, the golden tuning. It's, a, it's the tuning of a cello, you know? So, so the, that the three tubes are being separated in quints. So what also makes it in that type of way interesting, because over time, just imagine that something like this happens for four months. You go each day at seven o'clock your, on your daily way, you cross this plaza. Then you will over time run definitely in different type of tunings at the same time day because the moon cycle is different than our time cycle. You know, so let's say what's in the first week uh, in at seven o'clock low tide in the morning is in the third week high tide. You know, so, so, so you get, but still somehow 
your body and your musical memory connects this type of things together. So it was for us also really important to make it you know, very perceivable. You know, if, if we would have if, if we would have chosen the tunings in half tone steps or, or, or even smaller, um, you know, uh, uh, it nobody would really have realized who has not really musical skills this type of, 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 of differentiation. So what I just want to say is by such installations, the tuning, the way how you perceive the sound, how the story is laid out, how do you really connect with what do you connect and how you do this um, becomes in that type of way very important because at the beginning, uh, our idea of such installation all times was that you should encounter them like you encounter it a tree around the corner. There is just something, you know? And over time, you, you, you learn to love that it gives you a shadow, that it does this or that, you know what I mean? So it, it, these installations uh, would not work. And we have quite a lot of installations that run now. I think the longest one runs for more than 24 years now in public space. And I think they only can do this because they somehow become part of the environment. And, and maybe uh, before we do a kind of a little uh, a break, uh, maybe we could watch together Sonic Vista because this is also one what you can experience by yourself when you go next time to Frankfurt because uh, this, this piece runs since uh, 2011. And I think it also explains very nicely the type of research um, uh, uh, you have to do when you want to do such pieces. Could you do this, Michael, please? The city of France invited ONA to make an assessment of the sonic qualities of the Frankfurt Green Belt. We studied the sound sources, the built environment, the acoustics, the social usage, the urban planning, the history of dozens of sites, and strove to understand what type of offer these sites made to the ears and eyes of the visitors. After discussing a whole variety of potential interventions, ONA settled on the Deutsche Herrenbrücke, an old classic railroad bridge crossing the main river connecting the north and south green belts for their 20th anniversary. It was named Sonic Vista because from this vantage point one can hear and see the city as a living organism. From the start, the project required the cooperation and support of a large number of city organizations, including several departments of the Deutsche Bahn, the Water Police, and our main sponsors, the Green Girdle of the city of Frankfurt. So here's the result. There were a series of challenges. How to make an iconic speaker that suspends from the bridge in all weathers, is seen from a larger distance and radiates in all directions. We developed the Sphere loudspeaker with help from acoustician Kevin Bastier and physicist Werner Lorca. We had to find a tuning system, choose lengths of tubing and positions that would generate overtone series, reducing the city and all its noise into harmonic proportions. After listening carefully to the sound sources on both sides of the bridge, we chose a low B for the south side and all of its heavy traffic and buses, and we chose F sharp for the north side with its construction sounds and pigeons. Our goal through all this was to provide a place, a sonic vista. The whole city could already be heard from the bridge, but people rushed past at a visual tempo and didn't give it a chance. Our job was to attract people, slow them down, get them to listen to the whole city as an organism with all its infrastructure rhythms, its intricate web of power, where they can gain new information. 
can you hear when you really listen to your city? The vibrations and power of the economy, what it takes to make a city work. ONA believe that with the complex cultures we live in now, we won't really understand ourselves until we understand our noise. Thank you, Michael. I think we can stop it and just just runs the sound through. Okay, the thing is why I actually also wanted um, that we before we make a little break before uh, uh, to to show you this is um, okay. Maybe what, what you saw this huge construction site is the European Bank, which was just built at that time, um, um, and the interesting thing is that this installation away. Um, was commissioned by a city department which ran a concept in Frankfurt which is called the Green Belt. And you have to imagine in the uh, 1991, um, city activists uh, realized what type of powerful financial uh, city Frankfurt will become, especially this was the time where they expanded the first time the, the um, the airport, um, uh, that they said, okay, Frankfurt will be so, so over commercialized in the future that we have to make now a kind of a commitment that we still don't lose the, the living quality in the city. And they decided to, to, to create what's called the green belt. So, so that they, they defined certain type of green areas, they have not be uh, uh, developed for housing or whatever, that they have to stay like this. And this was maybe one of the most interesting moves the city made, which gives her still till these days a kind of a, of a huge quality, living quality on one hand, but on the other hand, the similar things happened in Frankfurt, like I think also happens in London, that uh, uh, to have a space to live in, it becomes completely almost impossible. Uh, uh, the rents are so high, spaces are so expensive because because everything is so limited. But but still, the idea was that whatever whatever happens here, uh, uh, we just want to keep this kind of of green belt, and we don't want to give away all the goods uh, from the landscape from the topographical situation from the rivers or whatever just to to, to commercialize it and, and also to the to hide to new highways etc and and so the city was asking and you also have to imagine this was a time in uh, 2010 uh, 2009 after the financial crash and, and all these kind of things certain type of cities have been also uh, winners and losers so 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 the big powerful cities like like frankfurt they were just overshooting there was unbelievable increasing of 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 air traffic of new banking systems the european bank should be built there etc cetera, etc cetera. so there was this kind of also noise discussion in the city and uh the people who have been standing behind the concept of the green belt they actually thought about and they heard about some other works we did, especially in US and Los Angeles or wherever. And they thought, okay, they wanted to invite us that we make a piece which just brings this the, the sonic quality of the city and the environment, you know, just forward, just, just to give it a new type of discussion. And the other thing what, what happened at the time when we made this piece, uh, which shows so much about what sound really does with us, is 
maybe some of you guys still can remember, even maybe you have been just 10 years old when it happened, uh, when there was this kind of huge volcanic eruption in Ireland, in, 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 in Island, and uh, the whole air traffic in Europe was shut down for a week. Have you heard about this? So a city which was completely polluted somehow by hundreds of aircrafts, you can imagine that many, many people thought the first time, no aircraft, wow, what kind of a great day, the sky is blue, you know, I can hear the birds. Second day, wow, so super, so great, you know, third day the same, but fourth day, people said, oh, what happens to our economy? Then they also realized that actually they'd be completely dependent on this infrastructure hub of Frankfurt. So what then actually came up by itself, it came up that actually sound and the sonic quality and the auditory quality of an environment is very, very much also a discussion of culture. Because you can't go and order at Amazon a new book and wonder that the next day a truck goes through the landscape. So what you realize when these things pop up, you realize very, very much that this, the soundscape we are living in, the auditory quality we are experiencing has a lot to do with the way, what type of attention we give and also the way of living style we are performing. Like it was in New York when the boat didn't even take time to land normally. It was just pushing with the full power of the motor towards the quay that the people could jump on and out, you know, uh, which has some kind of resonances in this kind of, 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 of harbor area. So, but I need, I need now a little bit your help. I just see I'm... Um, um, uh, we are going now more or less straight an hour. So would it make sense um, that to make a little break and try to have yeah. after the break some, some questions or maybe do after the break a little uh, bevel exercise that we come into something like this? Yeah. Sorry, guys, I'm a little bit lost now. I don't know. No, that was a good, it was a good amount of talking, I think. I think we're all ready for a little break now. So um what do you think five minutes ten minutes what are people thinking uh, you 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 guys choose you you uh what are your energy time? levels like you can vote five minutes says tom okay let's say uh we meet back at so our time three forty-five. okay and yeah if you can some of you i asked the students i asked to bring a pebble if you can so uh, everything, everything will work. Everything will work. The only reason why I'm actually asking you, sorry, the only reason why I'm actually asking you for the pebble is because this little pebble, if you like this idea, what we will discuss later, could become a kind of a little reverence tool for you, which means what you carry around and what you where you when you use all times the same tool to hit on different type of things, then you actually can. You start to 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 create the kind of a sonic memory uh, in kind of relations, you know, from one material to another. And this is the reason why a little pebble is maybe a, a cool tool to carry around for a couple of weeks and, and fool around with it. Very nice. Okay. okay put very nice the text day. in there for the guests who maybe didn't see the the text. Okay. So see you all in five minutes. Okay. Thanks to Lisa for the use of the Chris up Zoom account. Yeah, we're very, very grateful. Much appreciated. It's so much easier on Zoom. <laughs> okay, so hopefully everyone's come back from a bit of a break now. Um, how should we proceed, Sam? Maybe we should do a quick pebble exercise, and then I know that um, students prepared some questions. Yeah, I would. I would just like. I would just like at first um, maybe. Since we can't do it in the way that we do together our exercises and then we talk. So maybe it makes sense if I give a little bit of a clue at first what this would be about. Mm -hmm. So when you know the whole the whole point um uh or, or one of the major points of, of of my work and what I'm also interested in is that I 
I really want to show and I, and I really want to want to be engaged by myself. I want to engage people into that the world is really speaking to us in any in any kind of way. And, <clears throat> and the other thing what's really so interesting is that you that through sound you really realize very, very much how heavy everything really is interconnected and, and, and how how really everything is in flux. And this little pebble exercise should do nothing else as to, to give you, and, and we are talking now not about making an art piece, we're really talking about techniques and, and things what we learn as artists maybe to help us to understand certain types of things. And for example, when you walk through a street or when you walk through a hallway, you for sure, it's, it's pretty easy to, to recognize that maybe one hallway sounds different than the staircase or the bathroom or the kitchen or whatever. But what's not so, so easy at the beginning is to realize also what makes the difference. What are these type of things? Why is a certain alley or a certain, uh, a certain little plaza from, from my ears or from my body sounding beautiful or less beautiful? Or what are the different type of characteristics? And one thing is what we could learn also what we talked at the beginning about language was that we have, you know, when, when we, when we, uh, when you listen maybe to my voice or to Michael's voice or Annie's voice and compare it to yourself, then we have more or less all of us running the same type of apparatus, but this, but the same principle uh, produces different type of mixes from a resonance chamber, the way how the, how the chord strings, the vocal strings are replaced. And what they are finally are doing is that they make a different type of settings of the four months. And the four months are actually this type of A, A, E, O, U. Is, it's also this kind of overdone structure, my voice, Michael's voice, your voice, Annie's voice says. And what this little bevel does it actually shows you or learns you all the time in connection with your bevel to whatever type of material you hit. It shows you a kind of a sonic response. So for example, I feel a little ukulele. When I do this on this, then for sure also the, this kind of corpus immediately starts to sing and whatever type of tuning I have here also starts to resonate. But the really interesting thing is if I dampen the tuning and I do it, that for my ear in this kind of talk, there is as a four month an A. You know, when I do on my on my table here or on another object, I find sometimes the sound going towards an E or an O or an U. You know what I mean? So so all of this kind of same talking sounds have different type of characteristics. And just by watching out through the different vowels in them, you really start to realize that certain type of woods or materials having the same kind of sound structure. And also if a material is whatever, I mean, I can't say too much because you have to do it by yourself, obviously. But what I just mean is when you try to, 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 to explore a little bit things with your little pebble over time, you will realize that actually you look at the class and you immediately also can hear it if you want. Because what these exercises are doing is they're building up memories for sounds. And your little bevel is, is just a kind of a little reference tool. I'll give you another thing. Um, um, and the same is for sure what you can do is when you, when you let it fall, you know, wherever you let it fall, since it's all times the same weight, the same material, it all times will speak different. It will. Normally, when you let it fall, it also will talk about the space or whatever. But I think this is now more than enough, and and I think it's it's also uh, got this described uh, in a in a in a simple way in the text. And this whole piece or thing came up because during Corona, I was asked to to come up with a little exercise for for kids and people how to explore their environment when you can't go out. And um, from the response, what they got, I saw that people really become super interested in this. So I hope you also like it and I hope maybe it will also um, um, be kind of a useful technique for you to expand a little bit your perception of the, of the sonic environment. Uh, should we make, once again, a couple of minutes 
break that everybody can do what he wants and then we talk about it? Yeah, that sounds good. How many minutes should we say? Um, Two, three? Yeah, I mean, let's 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 call it three minutes. Anyway, it only can be a kind of a beginning and if somebody likes it, then he will do it more often or he just thinks it's a stupid idea, then it's also three minutes. Uh, you know? <laughs> <laughs> okay, we're gonna do three minutes of exploring your environment with your pebble or pebble-like object. And then we'll come back and anyone who wants to share, talk about it, they can. Okay. So I'm gonna time it. Okay, super. Okay, that's three minutes. Super. Super, and now I will, I will definitely need your moderator help. So does anyone wanna share? about their experience of them and their little pebble over the past few minutes. You can put your hand up. So to put your hand up, then use the reactions button and then raise hand. Anyone feels like disclosing what they did in their three minutes. <laughs> it was hopefully pebble related. <laughs> okay, a couple of people, hold on. Michael and Kai. Okay. Kai, you go first. Uh, can, can you hear me? Yes. That's on my camera as well. My wife is spotty here, so sorry if I uh, cut out a lot. Um, I, I think sort of, I definitely need to practice in it, but I, I like the approach because I found myself going like going in thinking of the vowel that I was looking for before I actually did it. And then sort of my brain kind of went, Oh yeah, that sounds like an E. And then I sort of, as I kind of started doing it, I had to go and like just completely clear my mind before I went and then started mm -hmm. tapping on stuff and go and like listen to it as opposed to try and make that link mm -hmm. happen, like trying to force it into what I was expecting it to be as opposed to just mm -hmm. listening to it properly. Um, so I think I probably will actually do this a lot more. It's quite mm -hmm. simple, but it's really like, it's nice to just walk around and just, you know, it's another way of listening to your environment other than just sitting and listening, if that makes sense. Like it's not, it's more than just, I don't know. Yeah, I thought, I thought, that's a bit of waffle, but I hope that makes sense. But yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Kai. Thanks for sharing. You can carry a pebble in your pocket wherever you go. Michael. Yeah, so a similar experience, I think, but I, I got really obsessed with this, um, we have these big windows here in the office. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if you can see. So it's got like very thick panes of glass, which are very resonant. So when I started tapping on that, I just noticed like different formants and uh -huh. in, in each with each tap, but then I was trying to control them, but I couldn't. So I thought maybe it's how tightly I'm holding the pebble or maybe it's how hard I'm hitting the glass, but the only, I mean, how hard I was hitting the glass seemed to, um, like the harder I hit it, the, the higher frequency the formants were uh -huh. and vice versa. But um, at some point it seemed completely random, mm -hmm. you know, to be able to try and control the formants. But mm -hmm. yeah. Um, is it okay? Uh, uh, I think, can I make a comment on, on, on that too at first? So, yeah, we've got one more, but go ahead. Okay, please, please, please. Let, let, let's let's okay, let's have one more, more then. Lisa. Yes, please, please. Hiya. Uh, I'm just gonna go voice only uh, for now. Um that was great. I didn't have a pebble, but I had a, another sort of heavy object. Oh, sorry, emails. Um and uh, I was kind of wandering around, firstly <laughs> just tapping and and exploring, and then thinking, okay, thinking about this this really nice description of it, you know, building up your sonic memory of these different um objects and uh, environments. And uh, thinking, no, I know this. Okay, I know what the wall's going to sound like. And then tapping and then finding, oh my God, no, it's totally different actually. <laughs> and then going to the next object, like, no, okay, like, what do I think this is going to be? Okay, it's going to be roughly this high and it's going to have this kind of hollowness or something else and tapping it and finding out how wrong my kind of sonic memory is of, of these things that I think I know. So that was, that was a great exercise that I'll do again. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Lisa. Okay, maybe that's enough. Um, and then we'll, why don't you uh, respond, Sam, and then we can go into the questions after. 
Okay. Um, look, there are there there are two two things. To the first, um, sorry, um, what was his name? Um, name? Uh, who talk, yes, yes. I, I, I was I, the first I, one. I, yes. Look, I think the really interesting thing is, and this also goes a little bit together with Michael, is that you actually start at the beginning when you do this. Is my ex, but it's just really very personal. You know, there's no science behind. Um, is that you really try to don't think too much and uh the the thing is what but then maybe you give yourself a little task and the little task could be for example when i have a class you know what kai said that actually i start out with objects and things where i really control the sound where each time where i do it it's similar so but here we have actually already a kind of a very interesting interdependency because we all know this kind of game when we blow into empty bottles that they make this kind of whistle sound and actually we can we can tune them in the space in between but the same thing funny is not as obvious like with the with the blowing it also is by doing this how how much water is or tea is into the glass. So you really realize by doing this, for here it's very simple and easy to control the sound, correct? So when you then know actually that normally you can control the sound, then it's actually something very, very super and interesting to investigate what's going on that it becomes out of whatever reasons random. And the thing is what I always realize is especially by door frames, windows and all these kind of things is, that they have like a space has, because each space actually has at each geometrical spot its own acoustic. And the same is with bigger materials. So a big window has many, many, many voices laid out in one window. We see it visually, we see it as one. But the way how it's connected with the frame and what type of tension is on it or whatever, do you know what I mean? So, so it, it really it really brings you into this kind of world when you think also about it and play with this type of thing. It, it also brings you in this type of analogies where you really realize how almost everything, how we perceive or communicate is all times a kind of a you know, we are we are endlessly simplifying. So language, the brain, and everything what we are doing is just an endless simplifying process. But on the other hand, is when we actually come into this kind of sonic memory or sonic thinking, is that you will realize, like like for example, I don't know uh, if you ever have been uh, uh, reading something or seeing a movie which really brought you into a deeper interest to, to certain type of, of objects. Or let, let's say it differently. Some of you guys have had maybe already the experience or will have sooner or later the experience that they will become young mothers or fathers. At the moment when this happens, you will see much, much more strollers as you have seen before. You know, so, so whatever you engage with, it really brings certain type of things back. But the interesting thing with sound is that it, that it talks so much about this type of interdependencies of the material world. And before we go into, into um, discussion, uh, there would be also, you know, uh, and I gave you two links from the piece last year from the bear kind, but we, we, we just could only take maybe three, four minutes from the bear kind bell. Because this is maybe an interesting way. Um, um, I give you just uh, the uh, or can give you later on all the links of these things that you can experience more about it. But uh, we did last year, Hannes and I, uh, a friend I'm working uh, together also for long. We did an installation at the Bear, at the Halle am Berghain here in Berlin, where we, which was called Eleven Songs, where we tried actually to to use the space as an instrument and to also show this kind of psychotropic and, and emotional quality of spaces. So we composed uh, a couple of pieces. Uh, they were organized like songs, but where the space each time reacted in a different way. And one particular piece was called Berghain Bell, uh, where I could, or where we could do something what uh, all I'm strained about, which was that we split it up that we created at first a kind of an artificial bell. Um, afterwards, um, what we tried is 
we split up all the partials of the bell, laid it out on different type of speakers and played it as a continuum. So when you stand still in the room, you just hear a continuum of a bell sound. But at the moment, if you move, the bell starts to ring. And many, many people asked us, where are the sensors? But there are no sensors, you know? It's just the independency of the acoustics of a space and the type of material and the position of the observer. And you see in the video me walking with binaurals, and I think Michael will only go in for, for three or four minutes that everybody gets an idea how this works, okay? And then we go into questions, is okay? Yeah. I think, Michael, we get the idea. We don't have to do the whole thing. So what this shows in a very interesting way, I think, it really shows that actually each position in space has its own kind of sonic realization. You know, so, so uh, and, and for that particular thing, it was really, it was enough to just change five centimeters. And since, how these formats have been laid out in the in the in, in the space. Um, almost each little uh, spot in the space had its own interferences, you know, from from how how through the reflections how this how they integrated to each other. So where, whenever you moved, everywhere you had a different type of mix, and this is more or less happening constantly. But it's not it's not uh, laid out in such a poor way that we normally can't can't really uh, observe it so easily. We know it from, from, from uh, low frequencies that we can actually lay out in a space uh, just a kind of a very low sine wave and we can walk through the valleys and the, and the depth, you know, where we, we go from, a, we hear it very, very loud and then we go three meters further and it's almost gone and then it comes again because it just establishes the sound wave in the space but this also uh, are doing in a way higher frequencies. And this was what we tried to demonstrate with this particular piece. But the funny thing was for me that very, very less people even started to investigate it and to think it through in a kind of a physical and material and acoustical phenomena that all them thought, the first thought was all them, where are the sensors? Where are the sensors they are doing this, you know? So anyway, this was now, <laughs> please let Brilliant, thank you. So I put the link in and I put the link on the Padlet too for the students to watch, if they wanna watch the whole thing. Okay, let's move on um, to the questions. We've got about 20 minutes. I know that the group, maybe people in the group put your hands up and Michael, I think if you make them co-hosts, then you can either share your screen if you wanna do that or I can do it for you. Thanks, so it's Raul. Um, I think Eleanor, I'm not sure who else. Uh, great. Ben, great. Can you do that, Michael? And uh, are you happy to ask questions yourselves? 
Okay, you should have permission to share screen now. Raul, um, Is it Eleanor as well? Sorry. I think Eleanor as well, yeah. yeah. Hi, um, I don't know how to share the PowerPoint. I think Raul's doing it. Okay, okay, that's fine. You should have permission now. It maybe didn't work. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Great. I'm not sure how the others wanted to do it. Did they want to split up the questions or? Yeah, why don't you take turns if you um, if you prepared a few? Sorry, can you can you see the PowerPoint or? Yeah, yeah, we can. Thanks, Rob. Yeah. All right. So um, the first question uh, was asked by Dean, and he says, um, "In the Sunny Commons essay, you write of our pun leaving the tuning to installations. Both yourselves and visitors would continue to hear a trace of those harmonies even after leaving the sites and walking around other parts of the city." I was curious if this trace of the sound that would arise is something that only lasts momentarily or if the work acts as a um, way of training your ears to perceive these harmonies in the city, soundscape at will in any moment. Um, yeah. um, thank you for the question. It's a really interesting one. Um, so um, uh, can you hear me? It's okay? Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so, so the thing is that, that at first, um, it's for sure it, at the beginning, I think when you encounter it the first time, it's more like a temporary thing where it really goes also fast away. The thing what really happens is that you have to imagine you are conditioning your ear to, to consciously to certain type of ratios and resonances, what you normally not, not perceive consciously. And, and then you actually, you make yourself open uh, uh, and receptive for, for basically for resonances. And the other thing is when you, for example, maybe know this phenomena from a song or any kind of sound, you really like very, very much that, you, that if another sound appears, which has strong components from this sound in it, that it reminds you in that. So, so uh, um, you really, you really, tune in a way yourself to such a resonance. But the interesting thing is what really happens with what for me and for, for Bruce nowadays, definitely like this is that I can't hear cities anymore without resonances. So, and you maybe know this phenomena when you, when you work in music or you start, uh, I really remember for me, it was uh, completely magically that people were listening to a song or especially when I got interested in the chess, you know, and people say, oh, this goes from A major nine to, to uh, C major, whatever, you know, A minor to C major, whatever. And, and, and they just tell you uh, the type of chords they hear, you know? But the strange thing is when you learn to hear a major chord, a uh, major seven or a major nine chord or whatever, uh, at the moment when you start to hear it, it's impossible afterwards not to hear it. So you actually develop something in your perception and then it's, it becomes more, more or less out of my perspective, something, uh, uh, it, it, it becomes a kind of a, of a, of a tool or, or you know, it's something you, you can really rely on. And, and with, this, with this definitely, with this resonances, it's like this, that when you do this over and over, uh, you become very, very receptive to any kind of, 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 of tonal reson resonances uh, you encounter in, in, in the built environment. Does it make sense? Is this, is this uh, answered for you? I don't know if Dean wants to, is there or wants to say anything, but. Um, yeah, that was, that was a nice response, thank you. Um, how how did the others want to take the rest of the questions? Did they want to take them in turn, or um, did Dean want to um, say any more? Because I know that was his question. I think we're good to move on to the next one. Yeah. 
Um, wants to read it out. Helena, do you want to? I'll, yeah, I'll do. Um, what was the technical process of harmonizing ambient urban, urban sound with the tuning tubes? And what pushed you to go into the noise and create the harmony out of it? Um, you know, the thing is, what we're what this type of tubes are doing is more or less they're acting like resonance filters, you know? Because um, when you remember, um, uh, when you saw in Frankfurt, for example, in this video, when you saw the tubes or when you saw the tubes hanging on, on um, um, the wall, then we have to come back to the very first of the acoustics. You know, when, you, when we talked about the speed of sound, and then when we talk about that the speed of sound is 343 meters per second, and then the lowest frequency I can hear is 20 hertz, then this means that 20 hertz divided through 343 meters, that the wavelengths of this is 70 meters long. So what we also learned from Pythagoras is, and the monochord is, that actually resonances are uh, that when you hit the string or when you, when you play on your piano a, a really low note, uh, uh, then you not only hear this one note, you hear actually a spectrum of overtones uh, from this, because how overtones are defined is that they are being the even divides from a string or, or something in length. And what these tunings are doing is that they actually, and why we actually uh, came up with this idea was that they give the brain the chance to perceive something differently. So when you have, a, let's say, maybe a low D installed in a traffic environment and the motorcycle passes by, then in the sound of the motorcycle, uh, a lot of partials, they activate this tube in this type of low D, but for sure you still hear also the other sounds. So the only thing what it does is, that it actually enhances a kind of a tonal spectrum, which then allows us as human to perceive it consciously different as if it would be just noise. Thank I mean, you. I could talk about this for, for a day, you know? Yeah. <laughs> but um, but that, that doesn't make sense? Yeah, that was, that was perfect, thank you. And, and the other thing maybe what I maybe wanted to add to you is actually when we did the first time, because we came to this resonance thing through a founding in Rome, 1991, where we were listening to Roman amphoras, to this huge kind of amphoras, and where we realized that these amphoras were acting like Helmholtz resonators, that each of these amphora was just resonating one almost perfect tonality of the traffic noise. And so we made an installation where we we're putting a lot of these amphoras and different tunings together and played this kind of resonative sound back into the forum. And at the same time, a lot of Roman workers were there at the forum Trianon, and it was a very aggressive environment. And at the moment when we switched on this installation, the whole situation calmed down. And this was the reason why we finally called the installation Traffic Mantra, but we had no idea why this happened. And then later on, through so neuroscience, we learned that when the brain encounters an overtone theory, it reads the sound in a different part as if it's just noise, you know? And this is why, why, why it makes it perceivable and why people maybe at the installation, what you have seen at Blue Moon sitting on a cube and watching the boats and the helicopters and, and hearing them in a transformed way, why they then also get the kind of a, hyper reality feeling. But the really interesting thing is that on one hand, the, the, the feeling, it becomes a kind of a hyper reality, but maybe the first time they observe, for example, the, the rhythmical structure from a crossroad, how actually a city environment is, is, is more or less conducted by these traffic lights. You know, certain type of things become obvious. They are normally, by the way, how we would listen to it uh, being not um, observed. So the third question. Yeah, so the, the third yeah. question is, oh, go on, sorry. Sorry, um, yeah, I'll ask this one. Uh, so do you see your work as um, celebrating order out of 
sorry, creating order out of chaos? Or like, um, do you see it as like extracting like the harmony out of sounds that generally just becomes like noise in a city um, to be more like, like nature where you hear stuff like birds and they're kind of more harmonious and stuff like that? Um, I, I, I think it makes very, very much sense that you, uh, that you formulate this question like this, but um, honestly, it's, it's not so, it's, it, it really does not go so much into, into this direction. Harmony only means for us order. That's definitely right. You know, that, that it's definitely that we try to, to make a kind of an order perceivable in something which is very, very hard to perceive as order otherwise, but it does not bring up a new order. This order is already there in a way. But the thing, the point really is uh, that what we try to do with the work or what I have personally, I definitely also try to do is to, to create more, um, to create offers for you as a visitor or as a participant, which allows you to, to be consciously on place and in time. You know, so so where 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 I just would like that you that you um um you know, that you see this as 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 kind of offers to to observe a situation, to be at the place, to really to really question an environment. Uh, consciously and, and through experience, uh, what type of place is this for me? You know, what, what, uh, how are the things go together? So it's, it's more or less, I think we try to see it or understand it in a way like um, as an offer to, to, to engage what's going on and musically uh, is something interesting to listen to and actually also to more in a Cajun sense to, to offer your experiences like with the pebble also to read the environment more musically because you then when you do it in that type of way you realize that actually spaces have a color uh, uh, the uh, the way uh, how we communicate also with our objects or machine world this is all done in kind of musical gestures things have rhythms etc cetera, etc cetera. and I really believe in a in a weird way that if we would for example act more consciously in this type of way our cities would much more dance than stumble because we would we would shape them much more to the bodily needs we are we are having also in 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 conjunction with the environment that we are living in thank you yeah that's good um all right uh, next question what well, what are your thoughts on using role structures and spaces to create works and uh, what draws you to work with uh, urban spaces um at first i really i really believe from my <laughs> very first time um as a young student and maybe in the i had in the age of 15 16 i had my existential phase you know i was very very much into Camus and into into um i only wear, was wearing black turtlenecks and so it was I had a very particular way to look at the world um but what was definitely interesting for me all the time was to realize that actually cities are super, super interesting and super important compared to the rural environment where I was growing up because they actually allow you to encounter through this enormous diversity you are meeting constantly uh, new things and new challenges. On the other hand, um, uh, even we in, in our areas on the planet, you know, like in Germany or you in London, we still live in areas where there is, um, where they be definitely not balanced, but most of us uh, are not suffering from, from any kind of situations like 
many, many people suffer in Mexico City or somewhere else, so where, where, where the city becomes just a place you can't escape. So for me, the city is a place where which inspires me, but it also has a lot of its big drawbacks, uh, uh, especially when you realize, and now we come more or less into a political discussion, when everything is actually only organized under the premises of, of profit, profit and efficiency. Uh, so you pay an enormous price for this type of things. And I think the only thing what can change this in a way uh, is not that somebody says how cities should be, but that cities have a kind of a, a vivid narrative, that they have a vivid communication and discussion. And to make myself and yourself somehow competent for this discourse, I think you have to have experience. And so that's the reason why, why I try to offer experiential uh, work in cities. Um, I was just wondering if, um, if, if, this, uh, if this type of thought is, as, is related as well to um, any personal background, have you ever, have you experienced this um, type of, um, well, differences between these spaces during your lifetime or this is mm -hmm. some, something that you wanted to, to address even though you never experienced? You know, uh, uh, since I was growing up in a so-called rural structure, but for sure still also a rural structure, which was very, very much, very much man-made, because you almost find not one square meter in Europe, which is not man-made, uh, you know, uh, or, 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 or man-touched. Um, the thing is that Doing pieces in um, in more so-called nature-driven environments, um, uh, what we definitely have done, and 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 and, and I'm doing, and, and 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 constantly also doing, um, they go more in a they have more the direction of personal experiences. You know, very very much individual. Um, uh, they, why, why certain things drive me into the, into the urban is because I also really feel this type of need in myself that uh, at first being a social being and actually uh, that this is the place where, um, where, where things are cooked to say it simply, you know, to, to, uh, to, to, yeah, I, I, I don't have a clear, clear answer on this. <laughs> yeah, I was, sorry, sorry, one. Just popping in in terms of time, um, I was wondering if the Q&A group want to just ask one final question. I know you've got a few more lined up, but um, we'll have to wrap up. Um, is, is that, I can see right now the, um, the chat, is, that, is there any questions on the chat or? Because I have like um, th three more questions. Um, Maybe choose one of them, Raul. Yeah, there's no questions in the chat that I can see, but yeah, I don't think we've got time for all three. So maybe. All right, I'll pick one then. Um, all right, um, I don't know who wrote this question, um, but I'm, I'm okay, I'm going to read it. A common thread uh, through much of your work seems to be a certain grappling with, your, with our innate prioritization of the visual over the audible. While this phenomenon owes itself to exploration and interrogation, does this line of inquiry end at an artistic output or does it have further ex applications? Yeah, I mean, this is, uh, this is for me definitely uh, not the question which could be simply in just one sentence. Um, um, answered. The thing is what I just heavily experienced and find evidence almost daily for it is that the auditory domain tells a different story as the visual. 
I find myself in a world uh, uh, where out of visual decisions, uh, budgets and governance decisions be made and not so much of an auditory. And the auditory means in that type of a, not so much kind of a strict defining between visual and, and uh, uh, with, with, let's say, um, your visual or acoustics, it's really more that the auditory constantly is represent a world in flux. It, it constantly uh, represents a world which is dynamic, uh, uh, which is not really being able so simple to pin down, uh, uh, which, which uh, talks to you um, out of the area you don't have direct access uh, or, or, or whatever. So, so I think it, and the other thing what, what maybe was for me from the very, very beginning so interesting, even as a kid was, uh, I don't know if you guys ever have been reading a little bit uh, Goethe. Uh, in my education, I had to do this and Goethe was also very, very much interested in 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 senses and colors and, and 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 whatever and he was also a kind of a hopefully natural scientist in a way and i think in one of his writings it's also explained in a way what actually um madness means because the mad human in the 19th 18th century was the one who saw things they're not existing or heard voices that you know but it was somebody who was really overdoing one sense or was driven through his condition that he was overdoing one sense and i definitely had from very very early on the feeling that i'm living in a society which is heavily overdoing the visual sense and 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 this is this is definitely this is definitely something um, which is very very much uh, a, a personal in a way. On the other hand, you know, I, I'm completely aware of uh, what the, the the visual sense did to us and what kind of complexity and 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 uh, technological scientific progress or whatever it it it, it provided, but. Um, the only sense which in a very, very cheap way grounds me to where I am and what I'm doing in a way is actually when I when I stop and listen. Then I'm then then I'm I'm somewhere, you know? And and the way how we organized our cities, the way there's uh, our landscapes, etc. I mean the space between two destinations is really more or less only measured in kind of time what you have to use for it, you know? So it's actually almost like an enemy. Uh, so, and it's, and it's definitely not, not, not organized in a way that it's an experiential space. It's the so-called transitory space. Uh, and this also, this all fits very, very much in a language symbol visual thinking type of approaching the world. And I think out of my perspective, this needs some balancing. <laughs> and, and this is where I'm working on. All right. Um, there's another part for this question. Um, but I know this, this theme is, is a little bit complicated to answer in a few minutes. Um, so if, if there's any other questions on the chat, and I don't know if if I should proceed to to the last part of this question or we should end yeah. here. Please do. All right. Um, so the second part of this question is: Do you forhear and yeah, foreseen was um, mm -hmm. crossed here? Do you forhear a world where we train ourselves to prioritize the audible and visual equally? And uh, do you hope to inspire an audible awareness that benefits our ability to tune into the world around us? Um, no, I don't for here, like you, uh, uh, like you nicely said, this a world where we train ourselves to prioritize the audible and visual equally. I just, I have just from my own experience, I have the feeling that, 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 that we are so no letter, we are, we are we are coming into into a situation 
where we will realize, and hopefully it's 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 not uh, uh, easily said uh, 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 too late, that it's an unbelievable, um, cheap and interesting resource of information. What's going on? You know, uh, uh, I think the the problem really in all these questions, what we are talking now in the end is when we when we try to to split the auditory domain in one side, you know, when we when we make it binary, when we say, okay, there's there's the music part, this is the aesthetic, and there's the information part. But I think it's not it's not possible to to really do it. You really have to keep it uh, uh, as information and 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 emotion. Talking from the perspective of a human, you know, and um, because, because the real strange thing is, and, and 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 this is also a reason where I, where I, where I once again think that many of these questions we are discussing now in the end are really a question if we as as humans or as as, as, as social beings um, find a new understanding um, to integrate basically our essential input more in all equations we are we are taking. And, and, and when we think about our essential inputs, then we realize that we have certain type of senses that really become super, super private, you know, like 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 the, the taste and touch sense. Uh, but we have much, much more as these five general senses. But the th interesting thing is about the sound and the listening is that at first it's so, it's so, it's so on the border constantly that you, sound really touches you, and everybody knows that when he when he hears a bass in a in, in a club, you know what I mean. It, it really it it really gets on you. But the but the other thing what's so super interesting is it really talks about a situation you are in, a spatial uh, uh, whatever, you know what I mean. And and this is this is I think um, more or less a resource. Uh, we will be not able to 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 miss uh, for all the tasks they are waiting uh, for us. This is uh, sorry to 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 cut it down like this. This is a really good questions. Uh, they would be worse just to talk a day about it. <laughs> all right. Thank you so much to our Q and A group, and thank you so much to Sam. Um, for your questions and for your answers respectively. I'm afraid we have to wrap up because um, we're already we're run over time. Sorry also everyone for running over slightly. Uh, maybe just, I will ask Ala's question as a final one. Ala wants to know Sam, do you have a favorite acoustically speaking, I guess, city? Do you have a favorite city from an acoustic perspective? If you could say that. Um not not really because i think almost each each city has has uh, 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 beautiful uh, uh, spots or the only thing that i can say acoustically uh, cities like the old italian cities they are not grid built uh, having unbelievable uh, more and different musical transmission passes of sounds as a grid-like city is. And, um, and what I'm really interested in, the spaces where I live, I, I'd be interested in variation, you know? In, in, so whenever I be somewhere where one huge machine is dominating everything, uh, this is for me an unfriendly and, and uh, a place I would like to go. But, but as long as there are variations, um, I think in almost each city I have lived and, and, and investigated over the last 20 years, I have found uh, spots I completely love and I found spots I really hate it, you know. So, so I, I, I can't say definitive, uh, that's, that's it, no. <laughs> but I really enjoy Berlin, I have to say, I really enjoy Berlin. <laughs> Another reason to visit Berlin. Okay, thank you so much, Sam. I have 
still these many years later I still so I still learn so much from listening to you and I'm so happy that you were able to come and meet the students I know it's a little strange with us all in our little boxes but um I think the students have really like taken a lot from this there's like lots of nice comments coming through and um, yeah, I'm sure everyone will be um researching your works and talking and thinking more about what you said so I would just ask ask Michael is the two uh, the two PDFs what I send it to you from the booklet from the Sonspec Festival uh, and the and the map from Bonn. Uh, they could be just inspiration for the students if they have the chance that they can download it from you somewhere. Yeah, yeah. I've already yes. put those ones that you sent today on their on their Padlet on their so they can access that and I've just put them in the chat for any guests who want to download them yeah and and once again thank you to you guys sorry when i have been sometimes a little bit like this but it's not the most oh, easiest no. thing to to look on a little mosaics you know <laughs> <laughs> yeah anyway i enjoyed it very much and and hopefully i encounter you somewhere on the planet again brilliant thank you so thanks. much thanks so much, thanks so much. Ciao, ciao. amazing ciao, ciao.